Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We'll give folks a chance to just get logged in here. All right. Just wait another minute or so, and then we can get started. Well, all right, why don't we go ahead and get going because we have a lot to cover today. Um, I'm Jennifer Ewing. I'm the sustainability manager with the city of Bellevue. Thanks for joining us. This is our second in a series of three lunch and learns um, uh, that are part of our sustainable Bellevue plan implementation. Uh, all three of the lunch and learns have a, a theme around environmental justice and equity. Our first lunch and learn was on air quality and land use planning. This one today is on um, some of the work that our comprehensive plan team is done on the racially disparate impacts analysis, which is helping to inform our comprehensive plan update. And then we'll be doing another lunch and learn on September 26 on our climate vulnerability assessment. So I'll just go ahead and introduce our staff who will be presenting um, and then they can go ahead and get started. Um, Kate Nessie, who is a senior planner in our uh, planning department, um, will be presenting on the racially disparate impacts analysis. And then Sophia Fall, our sustainability program coordinator, will present on our environmental stewardship work and how we are, we are using a racial equity lens in that work. And then we'll have some time for Q&A after Kate's presentation, and then again after Sophia's um, for Q&A and, and some discussion. So thanks again. And uh, Kate, I think we can hand it over to you to present. Great, thanks so much. I am very happy that you invited me to talk about the racially disparate impact analysis. I, I think that the report has a lot of really um, good and interesting information about um, uh, Bellevue and um, the the um, past practices that race-based practices and the impact that those have had on um, on today. So go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll say that the reason that we did this analysis, uh, although it was interesting and certainly something that we wanted to know more about, but it is required under the um, recent additions to the Growth Management Act. And it's specifically in the housing section of the Growth Management Act. Um, and so most of um, most of the analysis is around housing. So um, the racially disparate impacts on housing, di housing displacement and exclusion in housing. Um, that we the report does touch on a, a few other areas, but that's really the focus of it because that is what's required under um, under the Growth Management Act. Go ahead and advance. Um, so it's also part of the comprehensive plan update. The, the Growth Management Act is um, what, what creates the, the law for um, planning in, um, in the state of Washington. And we're going through a comprehensive plan periodic update that happens about once a decade. Um, we, uh, as part of that, because there are some um, significant land use changes that um, are anticipated to meet our housing and job targets. Um, we did an uh, environmental impact statement. So the draft environmental impact statement was released at the end of April. And um, we're um, doing the additional analysis that was um, asked for in the FEIS. Because there's additional analysis, we're evaluating whether um, it will be released um, at the end of August. Um, it may uh, be released uh, later than that. Um, so just a little update on the where we are in that process. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This is what everybody wants to know. Where can I read this analysis? And um, 
we are looking at ways to make it more accessible. Um, uh, we will be posting it on Engaging Bellevue. Um, and, uh, but right now, if you want to open it at this moment and read it, um, you can uh, access it on the Comprehensive Plan webpage and it's under the update timeline. And it was released in, I wanna say June. So, you know, it's, it's around the June timeframe um, on that timeline. Uh, go ahead and advance the slide. Also, if you have ideas of where it should go on the website, please let me know because we want to make it more accessible. So the, the racially disparate impact analysis, um, it basically has three sections. Um, it has some um, recommendations on um, uh, actions and policies that, um, that the city should consider. Um, it has a... Uh, overview of the current conditions. Um, and then it also um, has kind of a, a history. And um, from the folks that I've talked to, a lot of them find the historical context incredibly um, interesting and um, uh, new information. So uh, I encourage you to um, go to the Comp Plan website and, and take a look at the document. So in terms of the historical context, if we go back um, all the way to the, the dawn of the, uh, you could say the European era of this area, um, there was uh, it, a, a lot of activity to try to push the people that were already here um, out of the area so that the newcomers, the uh, Europeans could, um, uh, to go do mining and farming and um, other activities. Um, so there were a series of, of treaties that were signed. Probably the most um, well-known is the Point Elliott Treaty. And uh, they were signed between this nascent government and the native people to um, sort of push the folks into ever smaller areas elsewhere in the region so that the newcomers could come and use the, the resources that were here and to build homes and, um, and all of that. Go ahead and advance the slide. Um, so um, as this area was building up, there was a lot of immigration um, to um, support all of that growth. We needed a lot of people to um, work on the railroads. There was also a um, smaller gold rush up here. Um, and, and then of course there are all the jobs that support um, people that were, are coming to seek gold. And that um, was supported by um, Chinese immigration in the mid 1800s. Um, and then in the early, so Chinese immigration was uh, prevalent in the mid 1800s. The federal and state governments enacted laws to limit uh, uh, immigration from China. And, and so that uh, sort of went down. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was uh, more immigration from Japan. And in our area specifically, um, there was a lot of uh, the new Japanese immigrants um, focused on farming and probably most famously strawberry farms, but other types of farming as well. Um, during all of this time, we had the alien land laws that um, limited um, how uh, the new immigrants could, from Japan and China, could interact with the land, whether they could own land, whether they could become um, citizens. And so the, the, the structure of, of laws that they were operating under was um, systematically different from the system of laws that would apply to say my ancestors from Scandinavia. So um, the, I mentioned the alien land laws, the Chinese Exclusion Act was in the 1800s to try to minimize the immigration from China. And then um, uh, as the, the um, Japanese farmers were limited first the, the immigrants, people born in Japan, couldn't own land. And then, so they would transfer the, the uh, land ownership to their children. 
And then that was limited as well. So when the executive order 9066 was signed to incarcerate the Japanese during World War II, um, a lot of the Japanese farmers didn't have title to their land. So when they were removed from their land, um, that land, they didn't have anything to come back to. Um, they didn't have a way of um, uh, maintaining that source of wealth. Some, some neighbors would, would um, kept you know, some of their belongings, but they didn't have. So that is one of the reasons why there wasn't a return to the land because they didn't, the land was, they were precluded from owning the land in the first place. So go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so during the first half of the 20th century, there were a, a number of ways that um, the local governments, um, it, you know, throughout the United States, um, would limit the who could live in certain places and um, restrict uh, people based on race. So one of the um, well-known ways of doing this was through deed restrictions uh, on properties. Um, so when a, a developer would develop, you know, a bunch of houses, they would um, put a restriction and say, um, this, this property can't be um, occupied by anybody um, of these certain races or anybody except uh, white people. And um, th that was a technique that was used in the first half of the 20th century. Beginning in the 1940s, it, um, there were some federal laws that limited that um, a little bit more, so it became less used. Um, but there are other uh, mechanisms that were not legal. I mean, not illegal. That <laughs> there were the non-legal mechanisms that were used to limit who could live where and who could acquire what type of property. Um, so, for example, if I were buying a house, um, the the real estate agent would only show me houses in white areas of town, and the bank that would be um, underwriting giving me a loan to buy the house would only loan me the money for um, houses in white areas of town. And so similarly, if you were Asian or if you were black, you could only uh, get uh, a loan in certain parts of town and you could only be shown houses in certain parts of town. And so this whole structure really limited the ability of um, non-white people um, to acquire wealth. And um, for most people, their number one source of wealth is their home and the property that they live on. Um, in 1968, um, these, these uh, restrictions are, were outlawed um, with the 1968 Fair Housing Act. So um, while de deed restrictions still exist on many people's properties, if you go and you I mean, it's a historical document. If you go and you look at the platting of your house, if it was platted in, um, they were most prevalent in the 20s and 30s. If it was platted during that time, it's not uncommon to find these um, racial restrictions on your on your deed. Um, the, the, it's a historical document, so there's not really a lot you can you can do about it. Um, but the 1968 Fair Housing Act said that. This, the, enforcing these is illegal. You can't enforce these deed restrictions um, on the property. And similarly, um, any sort of restrictions based on race that were put into the HOA laws or um, other things like that are not enforceable. Um, you know, after the, oh, I'm still, <laughs> I have a little bit more to say. So after the implementation of the Fair Housing Act, it's not like um, segregation went away. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but local governments used other ways to um, maintain segregation. And one of them is through zoning exclusion. So if um, until the middle of the 20th century is very common to have uh, a mix of housing types. So apartments next to, you know, single family and duplexes. And, um, it was very common to see that mix. Um, but um, in the middle of the 20th century, and even today, we um, uh, keep certain housing types together. 
And one of the things that that does is it um, limits the um, the range of economic uh, uh, people of different economic means uh, to live together. And since race and uh, income are quite closely tied, um, that in effect enforces um, uh, continued segregation. So you can now go on to the next slide. So we still see segregation in Bellevue today. Um, neighborhoods are segregated by race and income. If um, uh, uh, in Bellevue today, you, you can uh, take a pretty good guess if you know somebody's race and income, where what neighborhood they live in. Um, and you know, one of the things, you know, we all are hurting because <laughs> the cost of housing has gone up so so much in the past ten years. But one of the things that this, you know, historic legacy of, of racism, of excluding um, people from owning land, excluding people from owning housing, forcing them to, to live only in certain places or having a smaller um, uh, pool of, of housing available to certain groups. One of the things that that does is that when there is an increase in housing, like we've seen in the past 10 years, then it it um, develops more wealth for people who have housing and it puts people who don't have housing even further from possibly accumulating that wealth. So uh, one of the things that has happened in the past 10 years is that we've seen an even greater, it's, it's reinforced the segregation that, has, that is there. Um, you know, this segregation is, uh, has implications beyond just housing. Um, so access to opportunities um, like education that are, are location-based um, also uh, is a result or is tied to the location of housing. So um, you might be able to have easy access to jobs in a place like downtown because you live close to downtown, or you might have access to good schools because, of, because you have a... a um, so economically homogenous uh, uh, area that you live in. Go to the next slide. So, great. Um, so many people who work in Bellevue can't afford to live in the city. Um, I, I'm one of those people. I don't live in the city as a single parent um, on a planner salary, that's uh, not in the cards for me. Um, not that I don't love the city, I think it's a great place to live. Um, but, um, you know, when we have homogenous uh, areas, um, we need to find ways that we can um, uh, create a greater diversity of housing options. So one of the things that, that this um, report looked at was where there was risk of displacement. So if we want to create more housing options, um, there, the place where those housing options would likely occur is a sort of a nexus between where there is opportunity, um, so where, where people want to live, and um, where there is um, uh, less expensive housing or land that can be developed. And so the, the report found that the displacement risk, the, the nexus between those two was highest in the crossroads, Lake Hills, Wilburton, and uh, neighborhoods and in and around downtown as well. Um, it also noted that there are many, so affordable housing can be developed in a wide variety of ways. Um, one of the popular ways is to use a tax credit and if you use a tax credit, then those um, housing units are, are uh, re made to be affordable for seven to 10 years. And so um, that, uh, those, that, that range, that seven to 10 years is expiring for many of the um, affordable units in the city. And so um, we need to look at, well, how can we um, extend that or how can we develop more um, affordable units within the city. So finally, um, on uh, homelessness, uh, the report found that homelessness uh, disproportionately impacts people of color. 
Um, as you can imagine, if a um, group has been systematically um, prevented from uh, accumulating wealth, from having access to opportunities, um, from um, uh, you know being in in places that um, are are good for for health, that when um, the the factors that contribute to homelessness occur, that they have fewer resources to rely on and are more likely to become homeless. Um, and so that has um, disproportionately affected people of color. Go ahead and go to the next one. Um, and so finally, the um, current conditions around um, access to parks and environment, um, this I thought would be a particular interest to, to this group. The access uh, to parks is not equal across the city. And um, the places that um, are um, more white and more wealthy tend to have better access to parks. And the places that um, are poorer and uh, less white have less access to parks. Um, and um, uh, so that I know that's something that is important to our parks department to rectify, but it's also something for us to consider as we're updating the comprehensive plan. Um, also, the environmental health, health risks are not evenly distributed. Um, uh, uh, Non-white folks are more likely to live in areas that have more um, health risks uh, as well. Last slide. So finally, the, the um, report came up with some um, policy suggestions. Um, it noted that the current patterns of disparity are, um, are baked into our city. They, they started well before our city started. And um, the, if we continue with our current development patterns, we're going to continue to perpetuate those disparities. And so uh, the report rec had some recommendations for measures, steps that we could take to start to um, address these, the historical racism that has shaped um, some of the um, segregation in the city today. Those uh, specific suggestions are um, in the comprehensive plan. We have um, language that's not very specific. So it's like uh, in the character of or as appropriate. And um, when the language is not very specific, it can um, be applied uh, in an inequitable manner. So it can be applied to some people more than others or um, uh, some places more than others. And so they suggest to use specific language. So rather than say, um, uh, you know, uh, as appropriate to say, to spell out what is appropriate. Um, it also recommended to engage impacted communities and especially those with um, less power process. So uh, communities like that might be renters, they might be um, uh, um, people that uh, don't speak English as their first language or um, uh, are, are new to the city. Um, those uh, younger folks, um, those folks have traditionally had less voice in city processes, but um, are impacted, clearly impacted by the, the decisions that are made by the city. And then uh, finally, considering, they suggest considering the historical context um, as resources are distributed. So when we're looking at where parks should be, should go, um, we need to look at, well, why is there no park in this part of the city? And um, what can we do to counter those, um, that, uh, that historic um, and systemic racism that may have caused you know, a particular um, uh, system that is occurring today? And then think about, well, what can we do to counteract that? So with that, I'll stop. I've seen, I haven't read the questions, but I've seen balloons popping up. Um, so I'd be happy to, to take questions. Uh, Sophia, are you going to moderate this? Yeah, um, so I know some people have been putting questions in the chat. Um, Andre, 
can we start with some of those? Yeah, I think there was um, some questions about defining displacement risk a little bit more clearly. And then um, with that sort of, I think maybe you answered at the, the very last bit about how that's being addressed in the um, in the comp plan. But if you just wanted to maybe dive a little bit di deeper into the definition of displacement risk. Yeah, so um, displacement uh, risk is, displacement is when people um, have to, um, uh, sell or move their housing, it's sort of involuntary. They don't necessarily want to, but either because of um, economic or other reasons they they um, would, are pushed out. So you can think of somebody who is renting a less expensive apartment um, and that um, apartment or house might be sold by the owner to be redeveloped into um, you know fancy apartments. And uh, so that person would then be um, uh, have to find a new a new place to live. So that would be um, involuntary displacement. Um, uh, so you know we're looking at different ways in the comprehensive plan to uh, to address that. Um, uh, one way that the planning commission has discussed is to um, look at areas that um, uh, to be strategic about where um, uh, where places are um, having uh, more development potential um, and, and to make sure that some, there are some areas of the city um, that maybe have um, naturally occurring affordable housing to um, keep those not increase the development potential in that area. Um, so that's one way um, there's, there are other policies that the planning commission can consider as well. Great, thanks Kate. Um, and then it, it looks like someone also asked the current affordable housing info is confusing. How is the displacement risk in the identified area being addressed? Um, I'm not quite sure I, I understand. Kristen, are you able to clarify your question a little bit? You can feel free to unmute. What, I can unmute? Uh, so it looks like the comprehensive plan options um, identified some areas that would be subject to upzoning. Um, for more housing. Unfortunately, it looked like tons of those were existing, dense, and in a lot of cases, affordable housing. So if you have three-story apartments, um, there's a lot of people there. And if you want 10-story apartments and your plan is to tear down the three-story apartments and replace them with 10-story, you're displacing all of your most vulnerable population and, and it's not very environmentally friendly because you're tearing down and throwing away buildings and building new buildings. And um, it just looked like a, a huge potential problem. Uh, and, and so the, what was just said just now wasn't that. And so maybe it's being considered. It just seems like there's other places, other land that is, um, doesn't already have people living there in, you know, multifamily, that might be a, a better way to uh, add housing. Yeah, I think that's a really, a really great point that like the only way to, um, you know, according to economics, supply and demand, the only way to get um, housing to be a more reasonable price is to have sufficient supply of housing to meet the needs of the people who are looking for housing. So we, while we definitely need more housing, at the same time, we don't want to build all of the new housing, which tends to be more expensive in the places where there is like the last little bits of affordable uh, housing in Bellevue. So um, it, yeah, so we wanna make sure that we're, we're balancing both in uh, having opportunity to create more housing with, um, you know, uh, policies to preserve some of the existing uh, more affordable housing in the city. 
Um, so that, yeah, that's a, it's a hard balance to hit. And yeah, that was a good point. And we have time for about one more question. Um, so Marilyn asked, there are large parking lots around businesses. Does the comprehensive plan suggest ways to build on those areas? Um, and also Marilyn asked, what are regulation city requires of developers to develop affordable housing units? So I'll take the second question first. The, the planning commission is considering whether to have a, a mandatory system in part or all of the city or an incentive system. So right now in some parts of the city, we have an incentive system. If you build affordable housing, then as the developers, if the developer builds affordable housing, um, then they can um, have, they can build a little bit more. They can, um, if they build X number of units, then they can have X more units to build. And so it makes it, um, uh, easier for them to to build affordable housing and um, have more a larger building um, uh, so with the comprehensive plan the planning commission is is considering whether to to continue that in some or all places or to implement a mandatory system which would be um, if you build housing you must make x percent um, affordable um, and and so um, that's one of the things that they're they're looking at at um, doing. The other cities around us um, do have a mandatory system. Redmond and Kirkland both have mandatory systems. Um, so people building housing there um, are required to make some of it uh, affordable housing. So is the fact that you have um, a non-mandatory is that a function of a city council? decision or is that um, some sort of management administration it seems like mandatory is the way to go no that that is those decisions are made by our elected officials um and we'll just go with one last quick question claire asked what is considered affordable so of, affordable is based on the the uh, median wage in the area and the family size. So for a family of four um, in our area, the median income from all sources of income um, is somewhere around, I think a hundred or $110, $110,000, $110, something like that. So for a family of four, um, uh, the, the, they would be um, eligible for affordable housing if they uh, make under 80% of that. So somewhere around um, 80 or 85,000 for a family of four. Um, of course, with smaller family sizes, it's a little bit less and with larger family sizes, it's a little bit more. Um, so so that's sort of the, the cutoff for affordability. And you can, I'm sure we all know people who make $85,000 a year. So, um, you know, it's not, um, it, yeah, it, it is a, it starts at a very moderate income level. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I will share my screen again, and then I will present a bit more, um, on our work in environmental justice and sustainability in the city. I don't know why it started me over. Um, Great. Um, so in case you missed my intro in the beginning of the presentation, my name is Sophia. I am the sustainability program coordinator for the city, and I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about how we incorporate environmental justice um, and a little bit of our work in relation to what Kate just shared about the RDI. Um, environmental Stewardship Initiative is the name of the environment and sustainability um, team in the city, in case that's a jargony term you're not familiar with. So environmental justice, in case that's also not a term you've encountered before, um, 
is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental policies and laws. Um, this is a definition that's used federally um, by the EPA and other agencies. But what it really means is that every person, um, regardless of race or income or those other factors, deserves the same degree of protection from environmental hazards and environmental health hazards. And every person deserves equal access to the decision-making process of having a healthy environment in which to live and learn and work. Um, and so when we are thinking about environmental justice in our work, we are thinking about how to afford all of Bellevue's residents the same degree of protection and equal access to the decision making process. So I'll get into what ESI is doing to incorporate environmental justice into our work, but first I wanted to go over some of the regional frameworks for environmental justice um, for our region. So at a county-wide level, there are several policies that relate to environmental justice. One is H10, which calls for adopting intentional targeted actions that repair harms to the Black, Indigenous, and people of color households in our communities. Um, so this involves considering environmental health of neighborhoods um, and planning for environmentally healthy neighborhoods in the future. H18, um, is about inclusive planning um, and reducing disparities in access to opportunity areas. Um, so some strategy with that involves planning for moderate or high density housing that's close to frequent transit services, um, but not overly exposed to air pollution or particulate matter. H24 um, is about planning for residential neighborhoods that protect and promote the health being of residents and supporting equitable access to parks and open spaces. Um, while, while mitigating exposure to environmental hazards and pollutants. So that is some framework at the countywide level. And then Vision 2050 um, is the multi-county uh, plan, King County is part of that. And these policies, as you can see, are about addressing and integrating health and well-being into planning, and then addressing existing health disparities to improve health outcomes for our communities. So, this is some of the framework that we're using as we're developing our own work with ESI. Um, and then also, as Kate says, we are also developing environmental justice policies as part of our comprehensive plan update. So the first ESI environmental justice aspect that I'd like to go over is our tree equity score. Um, and this is part of our annual tree giveaway program in which residents can apply to receive up to two free trees um, annually from the city. This is important because we know that trees have really critical benefits to people. So in neighborhoods where there's high tree canopy, many studies have shown that people are less likely to experience stress, to develop heart disease or mental illness. Um, people in areas with high tree canopy are more likely to do well in school and have deeper community connections. Trees also have physical health benefits, so they improve air quality and they keep neighborhoods cooler, um, which is especially critical during heat waves. We also know that in Bellevue, neighborhoods with the lowest tree canopy cover are also our most diverse. Um, so tree canopy cover is really an equity issue in Bellevue and really across the country. In designing our tree giveaway, we wanted to address these disparities in tree canopy in Bellevue. Um, so we know that trees aren't a solution to structural inequity or structural lack of resources, um, but they are one way that we can consider equity in our programs. So with our tree giveaway, if demand outpaces supply of trees, we use an applicant's tree equity score to allocate trees. And this is a metric created by a nonprofit called American Forest Institute. And it measures how well the benefits of urban tree canopy are reaching those who need them. So it combines different factors, including race and income, as well as existing tree canopy in an area. And then it assigns a score from zero to 100. And the lower the score, the greater the need for tree canopy investment. Um, so you can see from this map, which shows the tree equity scores of Bellevue, that there are some areas that register lower for tree equity scores. 
So when we receive our applications, residents who apply from those areas may receive more trees um, or they may be ranked higher in terms of their tree preference. We also run programs through the Energy Smart East Side. Um, so Energy Smart East Side supports residents in the East Side cities of Bellevue, Redmond, Issaquah, Kirkland, and Mercer Island in switching to heat pumps, which if you're not as familiar with heat pumps, they are an energy efficient and fully electric way to cool and heat a home. And they also cost less to operate than traditional heating systems. So we have a few equity lenses through the Energy Smart Eastside program. Um, one is our boost program. In the boost program, households with an area media income below 80% um, are eligible for 100% cost coverage of a heat pump and installation. And this is important because it's allowing households um, to access heat pumps, which may provide cooling access, um, which is becoming increasingly important in the region with climate change. And also once it's installed, the operation costs for heating the house um, for many of those households are much lower than their previous uh, heating sources. We have a program called the Fuel Switching Incentive. Um, so through this program, Households at 150% AMI and below, whose primary heating source is natural gas, propane, or oil, are eligible for a $1,500 incentive to switch to heat pumps. Um, and we chose that 150% AMI uh, as a goal for that incentive because it aligns with the federal low and moderate income heat pump incentives um, guidelines that are part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And then we're also working with the King County Housing Authority to weatherize affordable multifamily properties in Bellevue. So this program supports low income residents in both single family and multifamily buildings um, to weatherize their properties, which helps make them more energy efficient and also increases climate resilience. So right now, these programs only consider income um, in terms of equity, but as we expand them and have further funding streams for heat pump incentives, um, it's possible that we may be able to introduce other lenses as well in the future. We're also at work on developing our electric vehicle roadmap. Um, so this is work that we are just now starting. Um, we're just getting it underway. And in developing our roadmap for electrifying our whole transportation infrastructure, including um, people's electric vehicles, we are asking questions that will help frame our EV transition in terms of environmental justice. So one element of this is to look at where charging stations are now. Um, so you can see this map comes from a resource called plugshare.com and it shows just where existing chargers are for environment or for electric vehicles. Um, and you can see that they are not evenly distributed throughout the city of Bellevue. So we look at where charging stations are now, and then we're also gonna think about where the market might be likely to expand charging stations. Um, and just as they're not evenly distributed now, we don't expect the market to just expand evenly across the city. Um, so we're gonna look at where the gaps will be. And we can anticipate that the gaps in charging infrastructure will most likely impact low income neighborhoods. So as we develop our electric vehicle roadmap, we'll be looking to address um, where the gaps are in EV infrastructure and how we can serve low income neighborhoods and communities of color um, in this transition. The city is also at work on a climate vulnerability assessment. Um, so it, will be released in late September. And this is only a preliminary figure at the moment. Um, but the climate vulnerability assessment involves kind of looking at which areas of the city are most vulnerable to climate change using something called a climate vulnerability index. And the CDI takes into account a lot of the factors that we've been discussing uh, throughout this session, like race and income, which determine where vulnerability to climate change is the highest. Um, and this is because of all the structural factors that Kate was discussing um, that make certain groups more vulnerable to impacts or less able to recover from climate impacts than others. There are other factors um, that might make someone or that tend to make groups more vulnerable to climate impacts. These include outdoor workers, people with existing health conditions, um, people without high school degrees, 
And as with all of these factors, these can be really intersectional. Um, people of, who are lower income, people of color are more likely to have many factors that contribute to vulnerability to climate change. Um, so if you're more, if you're interested in the climate vulnerability assessment um, in the climate vulnerability index, we really encourage you to register for our next Lunch and Learn, where we'll be able to talk about this a little bit more in detail um, and also discuss a little bit more about how our climate resiliency can respond to this and incorporate environmental justice. And then we also are looking to incorporate environmental justice into our future work um, and our future funding opportunities. So the Washington Environmental Health Disparities Map um, is created by the Washington Department of Health. And it's an interactive mapping tool that compares communities across the state and then within cities for environmental health disparities. So it, combines different metrics, including um, diesel emissions, air pollution, exposure to ozone, and hazardous waste sites. And then it also has measures like poverty and cardiovascular disease. And it can show some areas where environmental health disparities are highest, um, both across the state and then in a more granular, granular level within the Sea of Bellevue. So as we pursue future state funding opportunities, we can use this tool to focus on areas where environmental health disparities in our community are the highest um, and help pursue funding to close those disparities. And then in terms of federal funding opportunities, the Justice 40 map is hosted by the Council on Environmental Quality. And this map shows census tracts that are considered overburdened and underserved across the country. And we do have one census tract in Bellevue that rates as a nine, which means that it falls into this category of overburdened and underserved. Um, so as we're pursuing federal opportunities um, to help implement climate resiliency and climate mitigation infrastructure, um, we we'll be using these maps, both of them, um, to help identify which areas of our community we need to focus our funding on. And these maps will both be important for the EV roadmap and the Energy Smart Eastside program, as well as potentially future programs um, that we develop. So that is a little bit about our environmental justice work at ESI. Um, and we'll go to questions and answers very soon, but I first just wanted to highlight um, once again, our last sustainable lunch and learn series for now is on the climate vulnerability assessment on September 26th. If you registered for this one, you're not automatically registered for the next one. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about our climate vulnerability assessment, please don't hesitate to register and we'll go to some questions and answers. Um, so it looks like... I think Heidi has her hand up. Hi, um, so I have a question about I put a thing in about Northeast Bellevue and taking down single family homes to replace with bigger single family homes. So you're not really making more affordable housing for people. You're making less affordable housing. Plus most of these homes are having sprinkler systems put in. With your um, tree plan, spring, how do sprinkler systems work uh, with adding in new trees and not disrupting the plumbing? Uh, I can try to answer this one. I'm trying to see if there's anyone else who might have a better idea. I think um, for established trees, you know, there's really less of a need to water them. The watering needs for trees are really in particular in the first um, five years. And then normally they should be fine after that. I think, you know, with um, any property or home that's redeveloped, uh, you know, we do have our current code that looks at tree retention. Um, we are in the process of updating our tree codes um, with respect to installing. Um, Can I make a real quick comment on that tree retention? Yeah. So I'm in a neighborhood, they're not old growth trees, they're definitely replanted trees and they're 60 to 80 feet tall, but a builder can take up to five trees, major trees off a piece there's no restriction for the person who buys that property to go in and call the rest of the trees. There's absolutely none. And that's what we're seeing is that we go from 
you know, a pretty densely forested neighborhood to a thinly forested neighborhood. And all of a sudden it's a very, this summer, it is so dry and hot and the wildlife in particular has really had a hard time finding enough shade um, because of the amount of growth that's been going on in a three block area around my home. Um, so it's great to have a plan about restricting builders, but what about the homeowners afterwards? Yeah, the, the tree code will look at kind of the two scenarios. So one, tree removal, you know, when there's no development activity, which is what you're speaking of, either kind of before, in this case, after development. And then two, when there um, is, you know, desire for tree removal as part of development activity. So the, the code update is looking at both of those scenarios. And then, yeah, just on the um, irrigation I, I'm not familiar enough with the specifics of our code in terms of, I, I don't know that we have specific requirements for where irrigation goes, but I think that's something we could look into um, and get back to, but I, I don't know that there's necessarily a conflict there between new irrigation systems and, and existing trees. Um, let's see. Maybe next question. Yeah, are there any other questions? Um, either feel free to put them in the chat or you can also feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. So Ruth asked, will the city be addressing the need for more trees in the city street right of ways? I think that's definitely something we look at, um, you know, as we're, um, you know, improving any right of way, um, you know, so in particular, like for Bell Red or for Wilburton, any kind of major and, and smaller streetscape improvements, we are, we're kind of continually looking for opportunities to um, increase tree canopy in the right of way. So I'd say that's kind of part of our, our normal um, operating. Um, the transportation department um, was also, you know, had started to look at an update to, there's part of the sort of tree code, if you will, that's part of the transportation code. and. Um, that really deals with trees in the right of way. And I believe that work I think is currently on hold and will be kind of restarted after the um, tree code updates to the land use and clearing and grading code are completed. So I'd, I'd say, yes, the city is addressing the need for more trees is also, also part of the tree canopy assessment. We do look at um, tree canopy in the right of way and are definitely aware that that is um, an area for improvement. I think, you know, we've also found that um, a lot of the trees in the right of way are not that healthy. So some of what our um, transportation and parks department have to do is just, you know, continue to maintain the trees we have. And then we do often have trees that are dying that need to be replaced. Um, so that's also kind of a, a component of the work that we do to, you know, grow and preserve the, the right of way trees. Marilyn, do you have your do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. I just had a quick question. Uh, when you do the uh, climate vulnerability assessment on September 26th, will you talk about um, specifically uh, plans that the city has um, anticipating water if there is shortage of water coming from the Cascades and the whole um, sort of river system that we have? Could you address that in that session, possibly? Yeah, so definitely drought and water systems are um, both aspects that are covered in the climate vulnerability assessment. Um, and so they're definitely indicators that are being studied and are part of the report. Um, so certainly if there's interest in those in those impacts in particular, I think we could include them in our session. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, 
I could answer two questions that I saw earlier in the chat. Um, that would be, that would be great. So there was a question about um, the development of pocket parks in multifamily areas. Um, the parks department is um, in their park acquisition uh, plan. That is an area that they are are focused on is to make sure that uh, multifamily areas have. Um, access to parks, especially because they have less private uh, uh, access to nature. Um, another thing that's uh, under consideration um, in the update to the comprehensive plan is um, policies that uh, around um, bonuses for the development of parks or um, dedication of land to to open space. So that might mean that you know, if you dedicate a certain amount of land, you can build hires to, to make up for not being able to build across. Um, so those are two that it's definitely something that we're concerned about and we're watching and um, and looking for for ways that we can um, increase access to the, the parks and multifamily areas. The other question was about the development of, of um, very large homes. Um, and Heidi mentioned this earlier. Um, that's something that we see a lot in areas that have a lot of access to opportunity. So areas uh, like around downtown, um, we, uh, in South uh, Bellevue, um, we're seeing more of it in the Eastgate area. And um, certainly it happens throughout Bellevue. Because um, Bellevue is a great place to live. So um, <laughs> When people see the opportunity to, to redevelop a property, they often um, will take advantage of it because they know that that this is um, a very a place that people, a lot of people want to live. And so they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. Um, as Heidi said, it doesn't really add to the housing in the city. We don't get a, a net more housing. And so um, that's something that we're looking at um, in the comprehensive plan. It also is related to um, those those um, the justice uh, themes that um, I was talking about earlier. These areas are close to to opportunities, many of them, and so we don't want to have that um, high opportunity area restricted to a small number of wealthy people. We want to make it have access to more people, and so if they're um, so with the HB 1110, which um, allows the development of more up to four um, units on, on any parcel, that is something that could um, allow for the development of, of more housing instead of just restricting it to um, one very wealthy family. It could be more moderate families. So some things to think about. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and we're we're right up about on one o'clock. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming. Um, please feel free to reach out to me or Kate if you have any questions about our presentations. Um, and we hope to see you all in September on September 26th for our final summer lunch and learn.